Hey, welcome and thank you so much for tuning in. We have an incredible service uh, ahead. Uh, my name is Sean Satilli. I'm the lead pastor here at Crosspoint. And if it's your first time joining us, I just want to invite you to go ahead and fill out a Connect card. We'd love to share some information about the church with you and uh, learn a little bit about you as well. This morning, we're going to be getting into a message titled Expansion. It's actually the title of the series we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. And the premise of the series is when you look at the early church and you see the growth and incredible expansion that took place in the early life in the early church, you can't help but look at that and think to yourself and ask, what were the key components? What took place? What motivated them to this type of growth in life? So we're going to be spending some time looking at this over the next few weeks, believing for expansion of the gospel in our hearts and in the communities we serve. I'm excited to get in the Word in just a moment, but first, let's take a look at these announcements. Good morning, Crosspoint. I'm Charlie, and we are so excited that you're here with us today. If it's your first time, we would love to get to know you. Please go on our website or app and fill out a digital connect card, or you can go right across the hall to our Welcome and Information Center and fill one out right there. Our Welcome and Information Center, if you haven't gone there, it's new, it's fresh, it's open, go check it out. It's a place where you can find information of what's going on here at Crosspoint, ways that you can get involved, different ministries that we offer. Please take some time to go over there and check it out. Now today we have a lot of announcements, so stay tuned, and we have ways where you can get involved. So let's go. Here at Crosspoint, we are all about drawing those who are far from God close to Him. And the way that we do that is by first knowing Him, growing together, and making a difference. So here are ways that we can get to know God together as a church. Tonight, 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 6 p.m., you don't wanna miss it, right here, we are having a bilingual worship night we are gonna have an amazing extended time of worship in God's presence. Come on out, bring your kids, bring your family, bring your friends. Let's all worship together. May 4th is the National Day of Prayer. And as a congregation, we will be meeting throughout the Santa Clarita Valley at different high places. Here are the locations and the times. Please take a screenshot, take some notes down. If, if, if it fits in your schedule, please come out and join us. And if you wanna look at these locations and times again, you can go on our website, our app, and even across the hall at the Welcome and Information Center. We believe that God has created us uniquely to do community together and with him. Here are ways that we can grow together. Legacy is our senior adults ministry here at Cross Point. And this Thursday, April 27th, they will be getting together in the bridge at 1030 in the morning. There will be worship, a time in the word and fellowship. We hope to see you there. This announcement is for the women here. Spring is here and women's event is coming up May 6th. Mark it on your calendar, 9 a.m. You will be speaking on growth. There will be childcare available from birth to third grade. You don't wanna miss it. Here at Crosspoint, we have a young adult ministry called Forum. If you're from the ages of 18 to about 30-ish, you belong to our young adult community. And for those of you that join us every Thursday, you know about this. And if you don't, you're about to find out. For the past couple years, we've been gathering every Thursday night, 7.30 in the bridge to have our young adult service. Starting May, we will no longer be gathering every Thursday here, but rather we will be breaking out into what we're calling our forum groups throughout the valley. And it's our way of developing our community. It's a way of us growing to know God better, better in community and so on. So if you want more information about that, please, if you're a young adult, come on out here. This Thursday will be our last Thursday in the current format. And it's also gonna be what we're calling Big Thursday. So come on out to find out what that is. And if you want more information, go on our app, website, or Welcome and Information Center. 
Young adults, see you Thursday. Spring small group season is right around the corner. Signups are available now. You don't want to miss this. We have a variety of small groups to pick from. If you want to find out which those are, go online, go on our website, go across the hall to the Welcome and Information Center. God did not create us to do life alone. We are better when we're together. We grow, we help others grow. So please look one up, sign up. It'll be so worth it. Good morning, Cross Point. My name is Michelle Shaw, and I'm the director of congregational care here at Cross Point. And one of the ministries I have the privilege of being a part of is The Well. The Well is a place that we've created with the help of the Holy Spirit, where people can come and be loved on and cared for and ministered to and prayed for. And it's just been a blessing to see all the work that he's been doing in there. And we wanted to kind of build out on that and create a place where we can also have safe discussions. Kind of those discussions that you don't normally have at church. We want to make a place, and we did, where we can have those discussions. For this discussion topic this season, we're going to be discussing how we, as the body of Christ, can respond to and minister to people from the LGBTQ plus community like Jesus. We don't need to agree, but we do need to have this conversation, and we would love for you to be a part of it. You can sign up for this group, where you would sign up for any other small group, on the app, on the website, or at our Welcome Information Center. Or you can email me at mshaw at crosspointscv.org. Also, please email me if you have any questions. I'm looking forward to having this discussion, and I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Here at Crosspoint, our heart is to truly make a difference. And so here are some ways where you can make a difference. God loves to bless his children. He so loves to bless his children that in Malachi 3, he challenges us to put him to the test. This is really the only time in scripture where the Lord invites us to challenge him and put him to a test. Here's the awesome thing, is that this challenge is coupled with a promise a promise of provision over our lives when we offer him our tithes and offerings. Let me challenge you in this. Are you currently having financial difficulties? If so, examine your heart and your giving. If you currently do not return your full tithe to the Lord, why don't you give it a try and see how he blesses you? Here at the church, we have a variety of ways that we can give. We can do it through our app, through our website, uh, via mail, in person, one of our wall slots. Why don't you practice this, test the Lord, and see how faithful He is. I know those are a lot of announcements for today. Thank you for hanging in there. Please, if you want to revisit this information or if you want more information of what's going on here at Crosspoint, you can check it out online at our website in our app or you can go across the hall to our welcome and information center welcome home enjoy the rest of service hey, good morning it is great to be together and uh as you just heard there is a lot happening and uh i don't know about you this last week i kind of came off of a spiritual just high per se. And uh, coming off of last week, I was just so, just, I just found myself so thankful for all that the Lord is doing. Um, uh, which by the way, Melissa Mangren, are you? There we are. I want to invite you to join me. And while, while Melissa's coming up, uh, last Sunday was such a powerful Sunday. We had, uh, just as a praise report, we had 31 uh, individuals come to the waters of baptism last Sunday. 31 people got water baptized last Sunday. That is worth celebrating. That's worth rejoicing over. We also had 18 people um, go through our next steps class, and they took, a t uh, they took the step toward membership in calling Crosspoint home and investing in life and making a difference in a purpose greater than themselves. And so I'm so excited for all those who uh, took that step. Again, that class will be offered uh, uh, every month, once a month. And uh, so if you haven't uh, had the opportunity to go through that or take that step, uh, I want to invite you to sign up for next month and, and uh, get on that list. And then uh, we had several people open their heart uh, to a relationship with the Lord. So all weekend, just people taking a step in their walk with the Lord, moving one step closer. And come on, church, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about is helping people draw near to the Lord. Amen. 
So lots to celebrate. Um, speaking of which, something I'm excited to share with, uh, with all of you this morning is I want to introduce you first to Melissa Mangren. Everyone say, hi, Melissa. Um, uh, quick update regarding our kids' life department. And um, it was about uh, two months ago, um, uh, Melissa Prieto, our former director of Kids' Life, uh, informed us, let us know that of a transition, just a, a stirring that she felt on her heart uh, of a new season that she was to step into. And uh, she has faithfully loved and, loved and served our children and uh, just been a, a great part of our team. And though she's going to continue to fellowship here and be part of the life at Cross Point, and, um, uh, it, her, her, this next step would re, uh, she let us know that it would remove her from uh, continuing to serve in that role and in that capacity. And so that left us in a place where we began seeking the Lord and just asking him for clarity and direction as far as what he has for Crosspoint and for the, for the church. And uh, that's where he led us to Melissa Mangren. And so Melissa is joining our team, and, uh, or has joined our team now, and uh, has accepted the role as our director of Kids Life and will be leading our children's ministries. And so we are so excited. Um, <laughs> To have you on our team. And uh, for those of you who've not had the opportunity to meet Melissa, she is, she's phenomenal. And uh, one of the things, not only is she a people person, um, and, but she has this, a huge heart for children. And uh, in addition to uh, uh, being li- a licensed pastor, licensed minister with uh, uh, even prior to joining our team, uh, most recently working with junior hires, um, just in sitting with her and talking with her, hearing her heart for vision and direction for what's next, um, I'm just thrilled as we enter into this ne- next season and for all that the Lord has for us. And um, I just wanted to, uh, first, uh, Pastor Michelle, I'd like to invite you up. Pastor Michelle, who um, provides uh, uh, oversight to all of our, our Kids Life Department, but I wanted to um, pray for you in just a moment. But before we do, um, I don't know if there's anything you'd wish to share, just even what the Lord is doing in your heart. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Good morning. Nice to be here with all of you. Um, Yeah, I feel like the Lord is just stirring, you know, in our hearts this past few weeks with Easter and all the great, exciting things that's been happening. We were speaking last week on um, the road to Emmaus and how the gentlemen walking there had this burning in their soul as they were talking to Jesus and didn't realize he was standing there. And um, I feel that burning in in my heart, just like so ready to see where God is going to take our children's ministry. I am sorry. I cry for everything. <laughs> I was, That's one of my passionate things. I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm sad. It's just, um, it's overwhelming joy of knowing that God um, has a a season ahead of us for our kids, but just to also see that um, the Bible says, uh, Jesus himself said, you know, don't hinder these children. Let them come to me um, for, for the kingdom is, is belongs to such as them. And that is, is that our children are the ones with the untainted faith, the untainted courage to step out and believe in the unseen. And so that is where I feel the Lord is taking us into the unseen and let us learn from our children. Um, and along with that, let's bring our families back to family. You know, let's, let's teach our children to serve alongside their mothers and their fathers and, and um, continue to show them what it means to raise them up. I am a mom of three and um, I'm in a season of life where I'm letting some exit my life to be adults and, and learning that, using that to experience of knowing that there's so many things you're not prepared for as a parent. So let's get together and have you know parent groups so we, we can encourage each other and share stories. Um, so, so many things we'd love to do in children's ministry. But along with that, um, we have Mother's Day coming up. So dad, I'm sure shouting out to you right now. Um, Moms don't get the day off, so if you're a volunteer, have been cleared, please let me know. Um, We'd love to help moms uh, regroup for Mother's Day and have some time to just be able to sit in the presence of the Lord here. There was a statistic you shared last service. Yes. That. So something that um, uh, that I've, I've come to understand is that our, our children see if they see their dad in church serving and participating with them, you have an 80% chance of them continuing on with the Lord in their adult life. Wow. And without their dads and out that visual, it drops down to 20%. So um, we already know that uh, the enemy is fighting for our families. He's fighting for our kids. Yeah, wow. Yeah, when I heard that, I thought, wow, what an amazing statistic and opportunity as well for 
us as parents and individuals to serve. And so we are uh, looking for individuals. If you're interested in serving with our Kids Life Department, now you all know uh, Melissa. And so it's a familiar face. And I just would encourage you, introduce yourself to her. And we have a volunteer application online, but we, could, we would love your help. We'd love your support as we continue to pour into to the children and to this, the, the upcoming generation. And so I'd like you at this, uh, at this time, I'd like to invite you to just extend your hands. Uh, I wanna just pray over Melissa as she steps into this new season. And so Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for uh, drawing Melissa to us and for, to this opportunity. Lord, having sat with her and heard her heart, Lord, we know that you have qualified her, you have gifted her, you've given the heart and the passion for this this opportunity. And so now, Father, we pray for your anointing to come upon her, to flow over her, Lord, to equip her and empower her for the season ahead. Lord, we know that you filled her with great vision and great heart for the season ahead. Lord, continue to speak to her. Give, her. give her fresh vision, new insight. Lord, I pray that our best days are ahead, that kids' life will thrive, and that, Father, we will see young children open their hearts, more children than we've ever seen before. Father, I pray that the children in this church would be like an army rising up of young believers opening their heart, taking hold of their faith, and drawing close to you. In their, at their age. And so, Father, we just pray your anointing and blessing over Melissa as she steps into this new role. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we're so excited for you to be part of our team. And can we thank Melissa again one more time? Thank you. Hey, uh, I want to invite you to go ahead, take out your Bibles uh, and turn with me to two passages. Uh, by the way, it is Small Group Sunday, and so uh, I have my small group shirt on. Our, our slogan for small groups is, life is better together. Life is better together. I'll be kind of unpacking this whole thought and premise uh, both today and again next Sunday as we, as we look at the word on this. But um, turn with me this morning to two passages, two passages that are intricately tied together. Uh, the first is out of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, it's uh, over in the New Testament, one of the Pauline epistles to the church in Galatia. Uh, so uh, Galatians chapter 6, and then the second passage is 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and Galatians chapter 6. We'll get to both of those in just a moment. Um, I'm actually going to ask you to multitask. We'll see how well you are at multitasking. Um, as you turn to those scriptures, I'm going to ask a series of questions. I want to invite you to participate. Feel free to just raise your hand uh, if, if uh, uh, raise your hand if you qualify for this. So I'm going to ask a few questions. Here we go. Uh, first question is this: How many of you, how many ever become close friends? with someone that when you first met them, you were initially kind of turned off by them or maybe enemies or just like at ends or didn't get along well, but you eventually came friends, became friends. Anyone in here? Show of hands, come on. Okay, keep your hands up if you ended up marrying them. I no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can put um, okay, how many of you have ever, um, uh, if you meet a complete stranger, uh, you just, you feel like you have to say hi to every person that walks by you? Like, anyone who walks by, you just feel obligated to say hi. Anyone? Okay, got, some of you. My wife, this is totally my wife to the T. Like, there will be somebody like 50 feet away. I mean, they're not even looking. She's like, hey! And I'm like, what? She's like, I just feel bad if I don't. I feel it's rude. And I'm like, they weren't even looking. Like, it's, she, she is totally that way. Um, how many, uh, on the, uh, to the contrary of that, how many of you prefer to only have a few friends, a few close friends, like really close, a few, like, but for those few, you just, you invest deeply. It's like, th those are strong friendships. Okay, some of you, good. Um, uh, here's another one. Here, how many of you are social butterflies and you just open up to anyone, e even the complete stranger, and within an hour, you are best of friends? Is, is anyone? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, awesome. That, that, that's good. That's awesome. We'll talk after service. I'm looking for some more best friends. And then my last one, here we go. Um, last one. How many, how many of you would say to some degree you have, uh, whenever you meet somebody new and start a conversation, to some degree there's a little bit of skepticism. You're not sure if you can trust them. You're trying to figure that out. Anyone? Okay. Okay, good job. You can put your hands down. Um, relationships community, trust. Um, I mean, as you could see throughout the room, uh, there, the, it, it varied by person uh, as far as how we engage and connect with people, how we relate with people. 
Um, in fact, theorists will have, uh, depending on the theorists, will have anywhere between four and seven stages of, of how a relationship is formed and built. Um, and though the theorists might, you know, have different, explain the stages differently, typically the first two stages have relatively uh, a couple of things in common, one of which is that initial stage, which they call the discovery or experimentation stage. And it's where you're just kind of, it's this surface level information and you're just trying to determine, you know, what this person is all about. What are they all about? What's, what's their motive? What's, what, are, what are they getting at, you know? Uh, but then that second stage, as you progress a little bit, is, that, is the stage of trust or trusting. And you're, you're uh, kind of trying to figure out, like, can I trust them? Are they trustworthy? Like, you're, you're, just, you're still trying to evaluate that and assess that. Now, I'd say that's the case probably for most. However, um, if you have young kids, you might know this. I mean, I go to the park, and when I take my kids to the park, they start playing. And, you know, suppose we're there for about 30 minutes. I'm like, all right, guys, time to go. And they're like, Dad, I just met my new best friend. Like, he, we just played so long. I was like, that's awesome. What's their name? They're like, I don't know. But, like, they, we just love to play. I mean, do you remember the innocence of childhood? Like, you would become best friends with anyone. And you don't even know their name. But you're, like, bonded at the heart already. Like, right? But over time, something happens. Something happens in our life, whether it's trust that gets broken you know, maybe it's something in our hearts. Maybe something happens to us and, 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 and it, it, we become skeptical and we're not sure if we can trust people. Maybe we don't trust ourselves. You know, maybe we don't trust ourselves. You know, and maybe as soon as, as soon as we receive gossip on somebody, we're so quick to share it. You know, it's like, I think in the sharing of, our, uh, the sharing of gossip of others, it makes the, the dirt in our own life look not as bad. And so maybe we don't trust ourselves and so we become skeptical of others because we know how we deal with personal information. Or maybe it's because of a hurt or a wound. But regardless, the Bible says that we are, Christ followers, are the ecclesia, the church, the called out. We are called out and called to live in a new community, to conduct ourselves and to be a part of a community that lives different than the rest of the world. Different how? Different in mercy, in grace, in compassion, in love, in forgiveness, he says, we're to be the ecclesia. This is the way God has designed us from the very beginning. The problem is, the problem is, is we know each other too well. And often we don't trust others because we don't trust ourselves. I actually heard a, 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 an old proverb. I'm not sure who to give credit to when I found this, but it goes like this. Better, better for others to assume I have issues than to allow them to get to know me and to remove all doubt. I mean, come on, isn't that true though? We kind of walk around with this facade thinking, gosh, I, if only they knew, if only they knew. But we'll see throughout Scripture, God, regardless or in spite of this, calls us to community. So how do we reconcile the two? He calls us to community, but we have a hard time trusting, trusting each other, trusting ourselves. And we're in this series called Expansion. And we're, what we're doing is we're looking at the premise of this is we're looking at the early church, the early church, which exploded and, and experienced enormous growth individually and in their hearts as well as in the communities in which they lived and ministered to. So what were the key components by which they lived that we might live by those same key components and experience life and transformation in our own hearts? One of the major imperatives in the New Testament that Jesus gives the early church, the New Testament church, is to live within community, that we are to be this ecclesia, this church, this community. But the problem is, the challenge is, so often we don't. He says this in 1 Peter 2, 9. He says, you're a chosen people. What does that mean, chosen? It means by unmerited favor, God has saved you, not by your own doings or works, but by his goodness and his grace, by his doings. He goes on to say, he says, you are a royal priesthood. What does that mean? Well, remember last week when we talked about water baptisms, we said once the veil was torn, once Jesus died for our sins and the Holy Spirit came, we all are priests now. We all have the opportunity, once we open our heart to Jesus, to have a direct connection with him. He says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, he says, that we are to be set apart, to be distinct, to live different in our life than everybody else's. Not, not that he, he's not saying you have to be a perfect person or a perfect community. But it's their transformation that takes place 5, 10, 20 years down the road. And he goes on to say, he says, you are God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So you're a part of this community. 
to all who've opened their heart to the Lord and accepted him as Savior, you're part of this community now. He says, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, we're in this community not because of how good we are, not because of our works, our doings, but because of his goodness and grace. Can someone say amen to that? It's all about what he did. In fact, not only are we created for community, we were, we've, we were meant for community. I mean, from the very beginning, you see this, that we were created for this. See, God take, took two people, Adam and Eve, and he put them in this beautiful, wondrous place, a garden. And he gives them three commands, right? And he, it just, I mean, just three commands. And whereas today, so often people will approach Jesus and say, gosh, you know, I've got to live by his, 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 his precepts, these, these, these commands in life, and they're so restrictive. Rather than looking at our life and examining this and thinking, gosh, maybe, maybe the creator, my creator, put these precepts in, in, in place in such a way that I would experience the abundant life he created me for. As my creator, he knows what's best for me. But we don't do that. We just say, ah, oh, they're so restrictive. But not Adam. First commandment he receives is be fruitful and multiply. And he's thinking, man, your precepts are good. They are gracious. I'm going to follow them all the days of my life. I will obey them. Number two, it's, uh, the second commandment, do not eat from this tree in the center of the garden. And so you're thinking, wow, every single day, Adam and Eve, they're going to be faced with a choice of whether or not they're going to serve and worship the creator or they're going to worship God's created things. See, every day they were faced with this choice. Do we worship God, the creator, or do we choose to worship his creation? See, every day they were faced with this choice. And you say, well, Sean, God shouldn't have put the tree in the, first place, in the middle of the garden to tempt them in the first place. Well, you know what that'd be like me saying? That'd be like me saying to my wife, babe, if you didn't want me to have an affair, you shouldn't have brought over an attractive person. Every day we are faced with a choice. I was in a conversation with a friend uh, many years ago and he said, you know what? I wish God would have placed me in the garden. If he placed me in the garden, I wouldn't have sinned. And I said, well, great. How's that going for you today? Are you, with, are you, like, are you sinless? Like, the reality is, is the decision, the choice might change, but there's always a choice. Every day we have a choice. And so my point is, is there's a choice and, and, and or, in order for love to be given. See, God wants not only a relationship with us, he wants that to be a, a loving relationship. He loves us. He loves us so much. And he desires for us to, to love him as well. He won't force it. He, he will never force it. And because of that, he gives us a choice. Why? Because in order for love to be genuine and authentic, love has to be freely given. See, you can't force somebody to love you. If, if you're forcing somebody to love you, that is not true love. It's not pure. It's not genuine. It's not authentic. You can't, you can't force somebody to love you. So God, because he loves us, he says, I'm not going to make you like a robot. I'm going to give you the opportunity to choose whether or not to love or to reject me. And so there's this choice. But then there's this third commandment, and it's pretty simple. It's to relate. Just be together. Relate with one another. Be with God and be with each other. And so God says it's not good for man to be alone, and, we, that, and, and he designed us for community and for a relationship. And so he calls man out of isolation into relationship, into community, in the same way he calls us to that. But, but we have a hard time trusting. We have a hard time with trust. We have a hard time. Often it's because we don't trust ourselves. And God sees our heart. And even though he knows we have a difficult time with this, he says, I know that deep down inside, there's, there's, there's a longing, there's a desire for relationship. Deep down inside, there's, there's a longing for community, for friendships, for relationships. And so how does God respond? He says, listen, I, I, I realize you're all wearing fig leaves. I mean, what did they do in the garden, right? They, they suddenly realized after they sinned, they realized that they were naked. They were naked and ashamed. And he didn't, they didn't want others to see who they really were. And so they, I don't know, they grabbed these fig leaves and sewed them together in some Italian design probably, and they covered themselves up. And that's where you see the first onset of masquerading, putting a mask on, hiding their true selves from each other. Now remember, sin not only separated them from God, but it separated them from who? From each other. See, that's the thing we forget. Sin not only separates us from God, but it, 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 it tarnishes, it brings death into the relationships we're in the midst of. 
But God says, listen, I, I get that. But, I, but listen, I created you for community. I want you to be in community, in relationship with others. And so here's the three things that, that, that happen according to the Bible, especially in Galatians 6. We'll land there. Number one is this. Community is where we bear each other's burdens. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, I will never forget, um, and, and I've shared this before, one of the most difficult times was the passing of my younger brother, but I will never forget the community that drew together here at the church, friends, family members that came together and supported not only me, but, but, but my family through that time through community, through relationship. I, like, I, looking back, I'm like, I don't know what that would have been like. I couldn't have imagined walking through that alone and isolated. You know, um, about 14, 15 years ago, I led a, a mission team to, to uh, Thailand. And while we were in Thailand, one of the things that we did is we went up to one of the hill countries called Mae Sot. It's kind of one of the jungle regions, jungle territories of, of Thailand. And while we were there, we, we were helping this, this small four-square church with a, with a building project. And one of the tasks for that day was, was relocating, moving this mud and dirt from one area to another area so they can build on, on this, 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 this space. So me and uh, one of the, the individuals on the team, his name was Anthony. Me and Anthony, we were, we were provided two wagons, or um, two wheelbarrows. Uh, to, to help us in the moving of this mud. Now, these two wheelbarrows, you'd think this would be a help, but one wheelbarrow, the tire was flat and there was no way to pump up the tire. And if you've ever pushed a flat wheelbarrow, it's just, it's, I mean, I don't know, it's just incredibly difficult. And then the other one had a crooked wheel. So this thing wobbled as you pushed it. So all that to say, this day we go out there, we're moving mud and it is pouring down rain, not like California rain, but like monsoon rain, just downpour and we are soaked and this mud which is not really mud it's more like clay and when you get clay wet and it's just it it is heavy it is sticky and so we're moving we had to load these wheelbarrows full of mud push it up this hill and then dump it and then go back down the hill and and do that over and over and I just remember there was this moment where I, I got up to the top of the hill I dumped my wheelbarrow and I'm looking down at Anthony and, and poor Anthony, man, this guy's down there. It, the rain's just pouring. He's soaked and dripping. And he's got this wheelbarrow full of, of, of this mud clay. And he's just, he's slipping and sliding, trying to push this wheelbarrow up the hill. And he does one of these. He just, he slips and just face plants it into this mud. His face is just covered. And I'm just, you know, poor, I'm just up there just dying laughing. I'm just like, I, I'm just having the time of my life. And he looks up, mud in his face. He's like, dude, are you just going to stand up there? Are you going to come and help me or what? And, and so, so I make my way down the hill and, and, and I come alongside him. And then I take one side, he takes the other side. And then we, we, we count to three, we both start moving. We're both slipping. Our faces are both falling in the mud. My shoe, I think by the time we were done, we lost both of our shoes because it like sunk into the clay and it was like... Phew. You know, like just lost our shoes. It was like one of those just experiences. But we got the wheelbarrow up the hill and we were able to dump the mud and we did this a few more times before we called it quits. And I remember thinking to myself, it was after that moment that I just felt like the Lord just just gave me this example that forever stuck with me. That if we're gonna bear each other's burdens, you can't bear each other's burdens from a distance. It's gonna require you to come down the hill. It's gonna require you to get dirty. You're gonna get into the other person's mess. You're gonna feel their pain. You're gonna feel their strain. You're gonna distribute the weight evenly so that you can make it up, help that person make it up the hill that they otherwise wouldn't be able to make it up. But you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to lift a little bit. You're gonna feel some weight, you're gonna feel some strain. It might be messy, it might cost you something. Listen, nobody can rescue a drowning person from the shore. I mean, you can't, you can't hey, swim harder. Like, like, how are you going to rescue somebody from a distance? I mean, unless you had a really long rope and a great throw. You can't. You have to get in the water. And, and, and you have to get cold. You have to get in the water. You have to be willing to risk it because you know if you're going to rescue a drowning person, when you do that, what might they do? They might hit you because they're, they're wailing, flailing. Their, their arms are swinging. They might knock you out even though you're trying to rescue the drowning person. You might get knocked out. It might hurt. It might be painful. It might require, of you, require something of you. See, bearing each other's burdens is not a, a matter of convenience. It's not. 
you'll experience the pain. You'll experience all of that. But the Bible is clear. It says we're to bear each other's burdens in this community as to what? As to fulfill the law of Christ. What is that law? I mean, that second part, what is he talking about? He's saying Jesus did not come to simply share in your burdens. What did he do? Jesus came and he took all of our burdens, all of our sin, all of our iniquity. He bore all of it 100%. He bore 100% of it on the cross, on our behalf. And if our heart is truly changed, when we understand that and what Jesus did for us, that revelation, that encounter with the Lord, would change our heart to such a degree that as Christ followers, we'd be moved by that same compassion and mercy and grace to go on and bear each other's burdens in the same way Christ bore ours. And if you say, and you're here and you're saying, well, Pastor Sean, I, I just don't have that desire to. I don't, I don't desire. Listen, guilt, guilt won't work. I mean, nowhere in scripture do you see Jesus guilt motiva- using guilt as a motivation tactic. It, it only comes through revelation, a, 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 an encounter with the Lord, a, re- a change of heart. And if you don't have that mercy, that compassion in you, then I'd say pursue Jesus and pray for an encounter with his love. And, if you do, and, and, and as you do that, sooner or later, you'll realize something. Sooner or, or, sooner or later, you'll realize whether or not you're in deep community or shallow community. See, there will come a point in everyone's life. I don't know what that point is for you, but often the point that brings it to a revelation is through a trauma or experience. When a trial comes into your life, See, trials have a way of revealing things about us. And one of the things the trial uh, will reveal is whether or not you're part of a deep community or a shallow community. See, if you're part of a deep community, a community that you've invested deeply in with grace and with love and compassion and mercy that you've poured yourself into, then when trial comes, you'll experience that support. My friends, Nick and Kayla, they, um, they have a, after having their own child, they went on and they said, you know what, we have a huge heart for children we want to foster and so they started going through this foster care training program. And while they were going through that, they got a call. They hadn't even uh, totally finished the training. They got a phone call. And they said, it was from the foster care system. They said, you know what? There's a, 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 a little girl. This little girl, she's eight days old. She's eight days old. Her mother has left her in the hospital. We can't find the mother. The mother was, was a drug addict. And so this little girl, eight days old, is... is having withdrawals, she's withdrawing off the drugs her mother was on. We have no one to take her in. None of the, uh, any of the other families we've called, they, they, won't, they won't, didn't have availability. Would you be willing to, to take her in? And they had less than 24 hours, less than 24 hours later, they were at the hospital taking this little girl in. As a matter of fact, they went through the whole system and to this day, they actually have adopted this little girl into their house. Every child they take in, and they, they continue to foster other children, every child they take in, they, 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 they have this child, and whether it's for one week or three months or however long, they say, we, we feel it's our mission to tell this child, you are loved, you are chosen, you are special, God has a plan for your life, he created you with purpose, and we pray over that child, we dedicate them to the Lord, because we know God loves this child and this might be the only love or opportunity for Christ's love that they come in contact with for some time. But I share that story because when you invest in deep community, when they they had 24 hours, less than 24 hours to take in this little girl, they started reaching out to their community and within 24 hours they had a crib, they had strollers, they had diapers, baby clothes, like the whole, everything they needed. This community rallied together and, and helped them get everything they needed to take care of this little girl. See, I don't know at what point in your life this might occur, but there will be, there will be a point in your life and you'll have this aha moment on whether or not you've invested in deep community or shallow community. Deep, deep community being one that is a dispenser of grace and love and mercy, and you're, li- you're living life through small groups. Listen, I really believe small groups and, and community groups is where transformation best occurs. And we'll talk more about that in a moment, but whether you've been in this general group or general community, or you've invested deep in people's lives, listen, you can't, you can't do that from a distance. And if you invest in, in community from a distance and it's a shallow community, then when you're in a time of need and deep, deep trial, deep conflict, you'll get a shallow response. Oh, well, maybe we'll help you. Maybe we'll do it. 
See, Luke chapter six, I mean, the Bible talks about this. There's a cause and effect. It says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. What's he saying? Jesus is saying, listen, this isn't rocket science. To the degree you invest in others is the degree to which when you're in that time of need, you will experience returned unto you. And if you're in that point and you've never, you've never invested, then that community will not be around you when you need it most. See, God says, listen, I designed you for community and for relationships. And in order for you to experience the abundant life that I've created you for, the community I've called you to be, that is only experienced to its fullest in the midst of community. But you have to choose. You get to choose. He won't force you. You get to choose what type of community you live within. And see, my question this morning is this. See, you can't walk with God if you're not walking with God's people. And so my question this morning for you is this. Whose, whose burden are you bearing? Whose burden are you bearing? Whose burden are you carrying? Who, who are you willing to lay it all down for to help in a time of need? Who are you willing to jump in the water with? Who are you willing to get muddy with? Who are you willing to risk it all for? Maybe it's a person in your friend group. Maybe it's a person from a dis- that, that you're just getting to know. Maybe it's, maybe it's your one life, that person far from God that you're praying for to draw near. Maybe it's a person in your small group that you've been doing life and community with for a season now. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a relative. Who's, who's that person you want to lay it all down for, to bear their burden? It's gonna cost you something. I love the story of Elias Santana. When I think about bearing each other's burden, giving of ourself to serve a purpose greater than ourself. Elias Santana, man, this guy, through, through the ministry Campus Crusade, he, went in, in, he came to the United States and um, finished his medical degree. As a matter of fact, he graduated with his medical degree with honors. I mean, just an all-star of a student, knocked it out of the park. He's originally from the Dominican Republic. And so after he graduates, he has this enca- radical encounter with the Lord and his heart is, is just totally transformed. And he knows and he feels it on his heart that the only way he can truly be a Christ follower is if he, he lives beyond himself and gives to a purpose, if he makes a difference in the lives of those around him. And so how does he do that? He decides that for one week out of the month, he's gonna hop on a plane, he's gonna fly over to Puerto Rico, use his medical skills and training to earn as much money as he can and help as many people as he can for one week. And then he's gonna fly back to the Dominican Republic and for the other three weeks of the year, he's gonna stand on the back of a truck bed. He's gonna hand out food and blankets and medical supplies and treat as many people as he can for the next three weeks. And then he repeats that over again. He goes to the Puerto Rico, earns as much money as he can for one week. And then he comes back and he invests in people, handing out food, and clothing, and blankets, and resources. As a matter of fact, he's doing this, and, and it's beginning to, to gain some, some attention from the locals in that, in, that, in that community to such a degree now that every time he comes and every time he gets on the back of that truck bed and starts passing out supplies, a whole crowd gathers around him. He's gaining favor with the people in that community. Now, this catches the attention of Julio. Julio, he's the leader of the Marxist group in, in the Dominican Republic and in that area. This is a group that you do not want to mess with. And so the crowd gathering around Elias gains the attention of Julio and his followers. One of Julio's followers shouts out to Julio and says, Julio, what are we gonna do about this guy? We need to do something. We can't let his group get larger than our group. What do we do? And you know what Julio says? The leader of the Marxist group, he says, you know what? Elias has earned the right and respect to be listened to and heard. See, I don't know if you guys get it, but when God calls us to live in community, he's not just doing it for our own transformation and growth. He's not just doing it for the life of those that we are investing in. Listen, there is something catalytic that happens when we bear each other's burdens and when we live in life and community with other people. Community, I I firmly believe, is the best place for life transformation to take place. Why? Because it not only changes your life and the life of those around you, it has the power and ability to radically transform and change a community around you. See, as a Christ followers, Christ is a wise investor, and he knows he knows if, if we invest in one, that investment that he's making will never return void. And he knows that by investing in one, his investment has the ability to multiply many times over. 
And so as we bear one another's burdens and as we invest in others, that investment multiplies and has the ability to change the world. So first thing is, is we bear each other's burdens. Second thing is this, we bear each other's sins. Now it gets personal. Hang with me here. It's going to be okay. Stay with me. We bear each other's sins. Take a look. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens as so to fulfill the law of Christ. So here's the, the, the working premise that the early church worked with. The premise is this, that life and vitality, abundance, that everything God created us for would be experienced in, 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 to its fullest when lived in community with other believers. See, why? The reason why is God's people, when you live in community, well, in community, you're held accountable. I mean, when you live life with other people, people are going to, others will call you on your stuff. And as a body of believer, we're, we're to do that in a gracious, loving, and restorative way. But that's where accountability happens. Am I, am I right? That's where accountability happens. I mean, in, in, even in the early church, they would have understood this. They would have used the example of Adam and Eve. Why? Because remember, when God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden, he did so because they had already kicked God out in their hearts. They, choose to separ- they chose to separate themselves from God. But that sin not only separated them from God, but from each other. And so God knew, he looked at them and said, listen, if you remain in isolation from him and from each other, that road is only going to lead further to further deterioration, death and deterioration. And so God said, I've, I've got a plan. I'm going to restore this relationship. But here's the problem. The problem is this. The problem is, is we are subjected people. Meaning what? Meaning we, 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 we lead with our emotions. We live out of what we feel. We can rationalize things that aren't even right. As a matter of fact, we can rationalize things that in our isolation, we can rationalize darkness as though it were light. We're incredible. We're, we're great at, we're, we're masters at rationalization. And so what God says is, I need you to come on out from hiding. Bring your fig leaves too, but come on out from hiding. And we're going to live in this community. We're going to hold each other accountable, live life together, but we're going to do it in love and in a spirit of gentleness and with mercy and grace. You're going to drop your guard and you're going to allow people to speak life and encouragement into your life and to see the sin beneath the sin that you're going to have people around you that will say, man, why are you? Why are you so angry? Why, why are you still gossiping? Why, why do you covet things? Why do you attach yourself to things you're never, I mean, we should never atta- attach ourselves to. And we do that all the time, even as Christ followers. As a matter of fact, when I first moved to California, I remember going to a, uh, I, I wasn't sure if I was a, uh, a UCLA Bruins football fan or if I was a USC Trojans football fan. And so I went to one of their, the football games and they were playing each other. And I just remember after the game, I'm walking and, and I see this guy, he's just, he's just crying, tears all over his face. He's just a wreck. And I don't know if it was just a friendly face or what, but he came up to me and, he, and, 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 and I was like, dude, what's going on? And he's just weeping and crying. He's like, dude, I, I just cannot believe. Why does the coach just keep putting them in? They're getting pummeled out there. And, and the Bruins had just been trampled by, by the Trojans, by USC. And I knew from that moment forward, I would forever be a Trojans fan. I was like, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. <laughs> so, and so, but here's the thing. Here's the, here's the point of the story. The point of the story is this. We attach ourselves to things that, that we think will bring significance and meaning to our life. But the reality is, is those things never deliver. And that's why cities fall apart. People fall apart when, when their Super Bowl team or their, their, the World Series, when their team doesn't win. And the, the horrific things that happen is we attach ourselves and we start rationalizing behaviors that really don't make sense. See, here's what the New Testament says. Let these soak in for just a moment. Acts chapter 2, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. It didn't say they tried it. They did, it didn't say, you know what, I'll test it out. It said they devoted, meaning they were committed. They were in this. They were always together, right? As a matter of fact, do you know how many one another's there are in Scripture? There's more one another's in Scripture than there are people who've jumped on the Dodgers band, bandwagon over the last few years. I mean, there, there are so many one another's in Scripture. Check this out. Colossians chapter 3, 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. There's one another. And with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, 
seeing, uh, seeing the God with gratitude in your hearts. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. In Hebrews 3.13, But encourage one another daily, daily, it says, as long it is, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sins or deceitfulness. What's he saying? He's saying there are sins and deceitfulness within our heart. And through that sin and deceitfulness, we can be deceitful people. And we can deceive ourselves into thinking, you know what? It's okay to live in isolation. I don't need other people's help. I can bear my own burdens. As a matter of fact, I don't want to bear other people's burdens. See, when you're, when you're thinking about living in community and bearing each other's burdens, it's also about who you're living in that community with. See, Hebrews 10, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of, of doing. What's he saying? He's saying there's some who are not going to want to gather. There's, there's some who want to do it on their own. They think they can do it on their own. See, being a part of a community, listen, church, it's going to cost you something. Stay with me here. It's going to cost you something. It, it, it is. James 6, 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Pray. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Listen, the reason why the New Testament writer goes over this over and over again is because he knew something. He knew that at some point, the Christ followers were going to ask the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it to bear one another's burdens? I mean, I've got enough burdens of my own. Why do I have to bear anyone else's? Why can't I just bear my own burdens and let them worry about them? Well, as a matter of fact, you can. He's not going to force you to bear someone else's burdens. It's a choice. And so he writes this in such a way that, that as Christ followers, we would know that deep down in our hearts, there's something more to be gained. And that, and that if, if not, we can become incredible masters at, at rationalizing even the most odd of things. I remember while I was in Bible college, there was always somebody, always a guy, and I feel bad even sharing the story, but there, there was always a guy every year that um, would always approach a girl and, and just, and he'd, he'd tell her, I just feel like the Lord has told me that we're going to be married. I mean, without fail, every year. And it was always one of these guys that, like, that, that kind of lived in isolation, didn't really hang out or associate with anyone else. They kind of over-spiritualized the whole Bible school experience. And, and without fail, there'd always be this guy that would come up to this girl and say, you know what? The Lord has revealed to me that we are going to get married. And she'd be like, um, who are you? <laughs> like, she's like, unless God tells me that, no way, right? And, and why? The reason is, is we become convinced. We can convince ourselves of the most bizarre and radical things when we live in isolation. You know, as a matter of fact, in, in my years of pastoring, I've met people, there was, a, there was a guy one time, he said, you know what, Pastor Sean, I believe that God was okay with, because my marriage was not doing well, God was okay with me having this affair with this other person. Like, how did you, how did you rationalize that? See, when we live in isolation, we don't live within community and have people around us to hold us accountable. I mean, come on. How many of you guys have seen American Idol? Have you seen that show, American Idol? Is it still, I like, do you remember, I just remember watching that show and people, seeing people go onto the show and I'm like, dude, gosh, where are your, where were your friends? Like, how, who let you get on this show? Like, have you heard some of them sing? It's so embarrassing, right? I, like, where were their friends to be like, dude, do not do it. Like, I don't care what your mom told you or your dad told you, you are not a good singer. Like, don't even, like, I cannot let you go on this show. I will not let you embarrass yourself in front of national, like on national television. Like, where were their friends to hold them accountable? See, it's incredible the things that we can rationalize when we live in isolation. But the reality is, is, See, when we, act, when we rationalize things, <laughs> the reality is, church, listen, every, hang with me now. Everything, everything is at stake. See, if you're not seeing transformation in your own life, I would encourage you, I would implore you to, to do an evaluation, a risk assessment, the risk being everything. And when you look at your life, have you seen growth and pro progression, transformation over time, not, per, not perfection, but pursuit? Suppose you were to say, I'm going to go hardcore on this diet for the next three weeks or three months. I'm going hardcore on this diet. No, I don't know. No chocolate. No, no, no caffeine. I, like nothing good that God has created. Right. I mean, come on. Um, and, and suppose after these three months, you look back and you've gained 10 pounds over the course of the three months. You look at what you're doing and you'd say, okay, whatever I'm doing, there's something that's not working. And you'd, you'd reevaluate. Suppose you signed up for a, a gym membership and you got a personal trainer. 
And after three months of working with this trainer, after doing the assessment, you realize you have 10% more body fat than when you started the training. You'd, you'd look at this and you'd say, all right, coach, something's wrong. Something's off. Something's not working. Something's not, something is fundamentally off. I mean, maybe for those of you who are more musical in nature, you, you take a guitar class or a piano class. And after a year of doing this, you, 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 you're worse than when you began. I mean, you'd look at this and you'd say, okay, there's something wrong with the trainer or there's something wrong with the instructor. Or, like, you would do an assessment. And all I'm saying is, is when you look at your life as a Christ follower, maybe not right away, but six months, one year, five years, ten years, do you see transformation? You see, do you see transformation? Has your heart been changed? One of the indicators of transformation and heart change is the willingness and matter the desire to, to, to help, to bear each other's burdens, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to go after those who are far from God, to be a dispenser of mercy and grace in, grace in a world that otherwise is not. See, when we come to Christ, I... You know, I think often when we come to Christ, we come with in, in one of two ways. One is we think of it as kind of like a get out of hell free card, and we're like, yeah, that was nice. But with no real desire for a relationship or intimacy with God. Now, though that might apply to some, I think more so it's we're in the other category, the second category, which is we come to God with a desire for a relationship, and we desire and we have a relationship with God, but we miss out on community with others. And we're working on this relationship with God and, 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 and we miss out on the community with others. That's why we read in Acts chapter two, it says every day they continued. Every day they met together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying, enjoying them in the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So we bear each other's sins. We bear each other's burdens. That's why we live in community. He's saying it's not optional. It's part, of, it's part of the abundant life. That to make walking with God and walking with others part of your daily life is how you experience the fullness of the life for which he created us. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off the falsehood. What's he talking about? What is the falsehood? Is it not true that we all portray a projection of ourself that might not be an accurate reflection of our true self? He's saying, take off the mask. Take off the facade. Let other people in. Let God in first, but then let others in. Take off all falsehood, he says, and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. What's he saying? He's saying, we all have things that we're walking through. We're all in this together. Don't walk it alone. Don't go it alone. Don't live in isolation. So we're to bear one another's sins and to bear each other's burdens. But thirdly and finally, we're to bear one another's fears. Hang with me here. This is the end. It says this. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. What's he saying? Remember, if you live outside of the community, then when you need community, it won't be there. It says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh, they will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit, they will reap eternal life. And so it goes on to say, and this is the, 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 the point right here. This is the premise. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. Let us not become weary in doing good. For in the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up what's going on here. There's a, it's a beautiful passage, so rich, so much going on here. But I want to point out one thing. Number one is this. Have you, see, Paul knew we would ask the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it? I mean, Pastor Sean, I've got enough burdens of my own, enough issues of my own. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? See, when I think about the story of me and Anthony, pushing that wheelbarrow up the hill, that could have been a story written of one man's failing and fault of a lack of accomplishment, of his own strain that ended in failure. But instead, it was a story written of two guys coming together who accomplished a, a, a task, the task that was set before us. Not only was the task accomplished, but a memory was formed. A story was written. Something that we will never forget. We will go on to share among each other and among others. And we each have this choice on whether or not we try to bear our own bear burdens and write our own story, whether or not we're gonna try and stress and strain and push this wheelbarrow up the hill full of mud that needs to be empty. We all have mud in our life, but we need somebody to bear that dirt with us, to bear our burdens, to help us through those difficult times. 
We all have this opportunity. We all have this decision. But I also believe as, as the scriptures unpacked, I believe it was a foreshadow, a foreshadow of what's to come and what was talked about in Revelation chapter 21, which is what? That one day there will be a new heaven, a new earth, and one day there will be no more death, no more weeping, no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain, that the old order of things will have passed away. You know, when I think about this, I, I, remember, I remember summers back up in Oregon and during summers, we'd go out, we'd drive down uh, the highway down to the Tillamook Forest. You know, if you heard of Tillamook Cheese, that's where the factory is. But we'd drive down to the forest and there was this place, kind of a hidden location where they had this, this footbridge. And this footbridge, uh, it, was, it was a walking bridge that would, would take you over this, this span of water. And I remember during the summers, it'd be hot and me and my friends, we'd go out there and we'd stand on top of the bridge and jump off into the water below. Then sometimes we'd climb up the cliff on, on the side of the cliff and we'd jump from the cliff down into the water. Sometimes if, if, it was, if we could find them, there were these vines that would grow on the trees and you could swing like Tarzan from these vines into the, into the water below. It was amazing. In the Bible, the word used to describe trust, the root of this word is careless. See, what I've realized is that as I've gotten older in life, I've become more or less, less careless. See, if I were to go to that footbridge today, I'd look at it and I'd say, you know what, is the water deep enough? Is there any rocks under there, guys? Before you jump, check for the rocks. Is the vine strong enough? Is it gonna hold? Or is it gonna break on me as I begin to swing? See, when I was a kid, I'd, I mean, the only way I knew it was deep enough is because the person who jumped before me made it, you know? Like, it's careless. But as we get older, we, we become so hesitant. And, but that, isn't that how we are in our relationships and community? We become cautious and we're weary and we're, well, let me check the vine first. Let me test this and let me, to the point where we don't even engage. We don't even make the jump anymore. God's saying, come on, make the jump. Have you gotten to that point where your trust in God almost seems in comparison careless? Where your trust in God is to such a degree that you'd say, God, whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. Wherever you ask me to go, I will go. Whatever you ask me to lay down, I will lay down. Why? Because I've seen your faithfulness, not only throughout scripture, but throughout my own life. I've tasted, I've seen that it is good. Have you gotten to that point in your relationship with God where you trust him to such a degree that your faith almost seems careless? Now, I'm not talking about standing in the middle of the street. I mean, listen, there's no cure for stupidity, but what I'm talking about is, are you willing to go wherever he says go? He's got an abundant life for each and every one of you. That's what I'm saying. He has so much in store for each and every one of us, and we've, we, we, we hang on so tightly. We hang on so tightly because we're afraid of what we don't know. And we've become so cautious that we begin to live in isolation and we miss out on the abundant life that God has called and created us for. And I'm simply saying, if you want to experience all that he has for you, will you take that leap? Will you make that jump? experience community, live life. To, life is truly better together, church. It is. That's why he says one day, it's as though there's a, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. What's he saying? Isaiah 1.8 says it so beautifully. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, one day, all the pain and all the sorrow that you're walking through right now, listen, if you're walking through it in isolation and alone, it'll be too much. When you walk through it in community, you can do it. But even, in, even the fear, even the isolation, even the sin, even the hardship of what you experience now, church, listen, what he's saying is, is one day, it'll all be wiped away. He's blessed us and gifted us with the gift called community, the ecclesia, the church that we're called to be. He's saying this is gonna be a support system for the now. But one day, one day, it'll all be restored. It'll all be restored. That's why he says in Matthew 13, let us, let both grow until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be turned, 
to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. What's he saying? He's saying one day, one day the community of believers will be gathered up together and we will get to experience the ultimate community. Eternity in heaven, in his presence, all things restored, no more crying, no more mourning, no more tears. Will you invest in deep community? Or will you invest in shallow community? God has created you for life and for relationship with others. Approach him with almost like a childlike faith, a careless trust, because it'll be in that community where life transformation occurs because it's in that community, in those small groups, that life is truly better together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I know that so many of us, Lord, so many of us live in isolation. Lord, so many of us have tried to push the wheelbarrow up the hill and we're on our own and we're stressing, we're straining and we, man, Lord, we need community. Father, I pray that at some point throughout this morning, your Holy Spirit has just stirred something up, revealed something to, to each one of us. The incredible value and importance of community. That, Lord, we all need it. Not only do we need it, but, Father, that we were designed for it. Lord, we want to experience everything that you've created us for. Every, everything that you have for us. And within each and every one of us, there, within every one of our fibers, there is purpose. There is, there is oh, gosh, you created us. For, with great plans. And Father, I believe that it's in that community that we discover the fullness of those. It's in those community, those places of community that, Father, our rough edges are smoothed, that the diamond is polished and refined, that we truly reflect the image of Christ, our Savior, in those moments. So, Father, refine us. Lord, we, I, don't want, I don't want any impurity in me. I don't want any rough edge in me to hold me back, God, from anything that you have for me or for, for our future. And so, Father, for all of us, may we have that revelation that, Lord, we want to go. We want to go. Take us. Lord, we go with a, almost a careless trust. Lord, lead us. Take us into the purposes and plans that you have for us. Let us push forward towards that goal not letting anything hinder us from what you have. Because God, I believe you are calling this church to be an influence in this community, in the lives of others, those who are far from God, to, you're calling us to draw them near. You are, we are your plan A for helping those far from God draw near. So Father, I pray that we would know you more and that we would grow together in groups and that as a result, we would make a difference in the lives of others in the community in which we serve. I want to invite you, just with every eye closed, I, I believe that maybe there's some who are here this morning and you just feel something convicting in your soul, something convicting in your heart, and you feel the Lord just stirring it up within you to get back in, involved in community, get back involved in relationship, get back involved in friendships with others, that you've been living in isolation and you know it's time to take that step out. And if that's you, just it, it, listen, it's not for anybody else other than yourself, but if you're making that decision today to pursue community, would you just lift your hand to the Lord just as a symbol saying, God, that's me. I'm making that decision today. Come on, lift your hand if you're saying, God, that's me. I'm pursuing community. I know I need community. And so, Father, with the hands that are lifted, I pray that you would surround them with friends and a support system and community to lift them up, to encourage them, to build them up, Lord, so that they would experience everything that you have for them. Keep your eyes closed. Feel free to lower your hands now. And if you're here in this place, listen, the most important community that you'll ever be a part of is the community of God. And it's very simple. If you want to enter into that community, if you believe that Jesus, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and if you confess that Christ has risen from the grave, that he died for your sins, that he paid the price for you, that he is your savior. Scripture says you will experience eternal life. And so if that's you, if you want to receive Christ as your savior and enter your heart this morning and become part of the community of God, would you now at this time with every eye closed and head bowed, would you be so bold as to lift your hand? Is that making that declaration if that's you? Go ahead, lift your hand if that's you making that decision today to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Go ahead and lift your hand if that's you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you 
that you created us and designed us for a relationship, to do life together. Lord, that first and foremost starts with a relationship with you. Father, I thank you that we are all priests now. We all have the ability to, to, to have that relationship with you. And so, Father, now I pray that as a church, we would take that step to be the ecclesia, the church, the community that you've called us to be, set apart a royal priesthood, that we would be dispensers of love and grace and mercy to everyone we know. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow, thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the message today. I pray and hope that the Lord really stirred something up in you and that there would be a point within the message that really connected and resonated with you personally. If you're interested in learning more about your next step uh, in your relationship with the Lord or more about the church, Crosspoint, I want to invite you to head over to our website, crosspointscv.org, or downloading our mobile app. Thank you again for tuning in and God bless you.